This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by the CuriosityStream and Nebula Bundle Deal. Watch until the end of the video to see a trailer for our upcoming Nebula original series, The Battle of Britain. Minus 15. Profi ignition. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. For the first time in human history, a spacecraft has flown through the atmosphere of the Sun, sweeping through the superheated particles of the corona, a momentous event that has provided scientists vital information on the nature of our closest star that may help us unlock its mysteries. The Sun's atmosphere, much like our own, is composed of layers. Where we have the troposphere, stratosphere and mesosphere, the sun has the photosphere, the chromosphere and the corona. We have a saying, hotter than the surface of the sun, but the surface of the sun, the photosphere, is not actually that hot. It ranges from about 6200 degrees Celsius at the bottom and 3700 degrees Celsius at the top. That's about the same temperature as a welding arc and air around a lightning bolt can reach temperatures five times hotter than the photosphere. What's weird is the outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere, the corona, is much hotter than the surface. The corona, starting about 2,100 kilometers above the surface of the sun, reaches half a million degrees Celsius, 80 times higher than the surface. That's like walking away from a fire and the temperature getting warmer as you walk further away. This is a strange anomaly and makes the Parker Solar Probe's achievement even more impressive. As, at first glance, it's easy to dismiss that the probe only flew through the upper atmosphere, when, in reality, the upper atmosphere is vastly hotter than the surface. The reason this occurs is one of the many unsolved mysteries of the universe, and as such, is one of the primary missions of the Parker Solar Probe to gather information on the magnetic fields and charged particles in this region and attempt to answer this riddle. To understand the achievement of the Parker Solar Probe, let's dive into the engineering and physics of its solar mission. The first big problem facing the Parker Solar Probe is actually reaching the Sun. Despite the Sun acting as the anchor for our entire solar system, getting close to it is not easy. In order to bring a satellite out of orbit around the Earth, we first have to shed its velocity so that it falls back to Earth. The same has to be done when trying to bring something out of orbit around the Sun, except in this case we are located one astronomical unit or 150 million kilometers from the Sun, and traveling at 30 kilometers per second, and anything launching from Earth will be imbued with the same orbital velocity around the Sun. This means, in order to achieve a tighter orbit to the Sun, we need to lower the spacecraft's orbital velocity around the Sun. And this is an incredibly energy-intensive task, especially when you add the energy needed to escape Earth's gravity. So let's say we first want to get our satellite from the Earth's surface into orbit around the Earth. This will require us to accelerate our satellite to around 9.2 kilometers per second relative to the Earth's surface. The satellite is now in orbit around Earth and traveling with it at 30 kilometers per second around the Sun. From here, we need to perform something called a home and transfer. This is an orbital maneuver where we either change the spacecraft's orbital energy to adjust its perihelion, its closest approach to the Sun, or its aphelion, its furthest approach from the Sun. To visit an outer planet like Mars, we need to increase our aphelion by adding to the spacecraft's orbital energy, while reaching an inner planet require us to reduce our perihelion by decreasing our orbital energy. To reach Mars from Earth's orbit requires a delta V of around 2.9 km per second. To reach Venus requires about 2.5 km per second. This is found using this equation, where mu, this Greek letter that looks like a U, is the planetary parameter of the Sun which is a product of the Sun's mass. R1 is the orbital radius we are starting from, in this case Earth's distance from the Sun at around 150 million kilometers, and R2 is the desired perihelion or aphelion. If we calculate the delta V required to reach the Parker Solar Probe's closest approach of 6.2 million kilometers, 
This would require a delta V of 21.4 km per second, over 8.5 times greater than the delta V required to reach Venus. That's an incredibly high delta V, one beyond the capabilities of any rocket ever made. But on December 8, 2018, the Parker Solar Probe launched from Cape Canaveral aboard the Delta IV Heavy, the world's second highest capacity rocket, second only to the Falcon Heavy. To give the probe an extra push, the Delta IV was fitted with a special solid rocket third stage, providing an additional 3 km per second of Delta V for the typically two-staged rocket design. Yet, even with this added power, the probe would have never gotten close to the Sun. To achieve its record-breaking flight, one-seventh that of the previous record held by Helios 2, the Parker Solar Probe completed an astounding five gravity assists by Venus, with an additional two flybys due in 2023 and 2024. This number of flybys was needed because Venus is a relatively low-mass planet. The magnitude of velocity change a planet can provide is largely determined by its gravity, determined by its mass. In fact, the original plan for the probe was to do a single planetary assist by Jupiter, which would have brought the probe three times closer to the Sun, but this trajectory came with some issues. Because Jupiter's orbit is so much further from the Sun, the sunlight reaching the solar panels at its aphelion would have been 25 times dimmer, requiring much larger solar panels to power the spacecraft. This poses an issue when the spacecraft makes its way around Jupiter and begins to accelerate towards the Sun. The heat of the Sun would destroy the solar panels, and at this size, they could not retract and hide behind the Sun Shield. Other options were available. A radioisotope thermal generator could have been used, but this would have driven the cost, weight and complexity of the spacecraft up significantly. The real selling point for this radical new flight trajectory was the added time and data it would provide scientists to fulfill the probe's mission, to study the Sun. With the original Jupiter plan, the probe would have had just 100 hours inside the desired zone around the Sun, completing just two solar passes before the probe reached the end of its eight-year mission duration. While the new Venus plan would mean the Parker Solar Probe would take less than 150 days to complete its orbit around the Sun, allowing scientists to gather over 900 hours worth of data over the probe's 24 orbits around the Sun. The change in plan did come with a change of design, moving away from the original conical-shaped heat shield to the familiar compact flat shield. This shield is primarily constructed from 11.4 cm carbon foam, a truly fascinating material developed by one of the most prolific material innovation labs, Ultramet. Under a scanning electron microscope, the carbon foam looks like this, an incredibly porous material dominated by open space, making its internal volume 97% empty space, providing the heat shield fantastic insulation properties while also benefiting from carbon's thermal stability. Next, a carbon-carbon composite, which is made by combining graphite with an organic binder, such as pitch or an epoxy resin. This mixture was applied to each side of the foam before being superheated to transform the binder into a pure form of carbon, creating a carbon-carbon composite. Finally, a white ceramic paint was applied to the sun-facing side to reflect as much of that heat away from the sun shield before it had a chance to even enter the labyrinth of carbon beneath. From here, the rest of the spacecraft, besides a few specialized sensors and solar panels, had to be designed to fit within the umbra, or shadow, of the shield. There are several instruments that bravely peek out beyond the safety of the heat shield, like the Solar Probe Cup, one of the many sensors on board. This thing is easily the most impressive bit of technology aboard. Completely unprotected by the sun shield, its designers had to get very creative with materials. The Solar Probe Cup is a Faraday cup, which is a device that can count and measure the properties of electrons and ions coming from the Sun, essentially giving the spacecraft the capability of studying solar winds and mass ejections of particles coming from the Sun. This is the cross-section of the Solar Probe Cup. It essentially works by applying an electric field over the grid at the cup's opening. 
By varying the voltage, we can select or filter out particles that can enter the cup, giving us more data on what is causing current as these charged particles strike the collecting plate at the bottom of the cup. It's a very simple device in practice, but with the temperatures it's facing, 1400 degrees Celsius, just below the melting point of pure iron, the solar probe cup needed some innovative engineering. The first challenge was selecting a material for the electric grid that generates the selecting electric field at the entrance of the cup. This grid needed to be conductive and heat resistant, while also being machinable to create the tiny 100 micron spaced grid. Tungsten was chosen, the same material used in incandescent light bulbs here on Earth, as they are capable of surviving the extremely high temperatures needed to generate light. Tungsten light filaments operate at temperatures as high as 3000 degrees Celsius, so they are more than capable of surviving these temperatures. However, machining tungsten into a grid this fine is difficult. Micron scale machining like this is not done with traditional tools. You would immediately break the grid with the force required to shave the metal away. Instead, lasers are typically used to etch away material. But because tungsten is so heat resistant, lasers would not be capable of melting the tungsten to form the grid. Instead, acid etching was used. Next, they needed electrical cables capable of supplying the grid with power and carrying electrical signals away from the collecting plate. The two most commonly used conductors here on Earth, copper and aluminium, would turn to a pool of molten metal in these conditions. So, these were most definitely not an option. Any conducting cables in this part of the spacecraft had to be made out of niobium C103, a special alloy of 89% niobium, 10% hafnium and 1% titanium. All the external casing components were also constructed from this exotic aerospace material. Normally, wires would be insulated from the outer casing with plastic, but this wasn't an option for the Parker Space Probe, and the engineers were forced to use sapphire to ensure the niobium wires were insulated. These are some extremely exotic materials to perform what is a relatively mundane job here on Earth. Other portions of sensors peaking beyond the sun shield are built in a similar manner. The magnetic field measuring instruments are hidden behind the shield, but they need antennas that reach beyond the sun shield in order to make their measurements of the sun's magnetic fields. These four antennas are also made from niobium C103. The solar panels were the next challenge. While cruising through its distant orbit around the sun, the spacecraft can fully deploy its solar panels without issue. But as the probe begins its sweep back towards the sun, heat will become an ever-growing issue. This can be counteracted somewhat by retracting the solar panels, but the spacecraft needs to maintain some power to operate its scientific equipment during this vital stage of flight. Here, two smaller, specialized, secondary panels remain sticking out in view of the sun and are cooled with water, which is pumped through the solar panels and into these black radiators attached to the titanium truss just below the sun shield. This truss is exceptionally light for how big it looks. The entire truss only weighs 22.7 kilograms, which even for low density titanium is very low for the size of the truss. The engineers at NASA have clearly triple checked their stress calculations to ensure this thing could use as little material as possible, which of course saves launch weight, but also minimizes the material available to conduct heat from the heat shield to the spacecraft bus. Testing these systems in the heat they are expected to meet is difficult on Earth. The Odeo Solar Furnace is our best approximation of the environment they would need to endure. This facility, built on a hillside in the countryside of France, uses 10,000 adjustable mirrors to focus light onto one concave mirror. The facility is capable of reaching temperatures as high as 3,500 degrees Celsius, over double the temperature that even the sun shield will experience. Parts like the Faraday cup and sun shield were placed in the focal point of this concave mirror and exposed to the temperatures they will need to endure. However, components like the Faraday cup also need to be tested while performing their sensory tasks. And for this, the engineers need a particle accelerator to simulate the electrons and ions it will encounter from solar wind. Combining a particle accelerator with this solar furnace was not an option, 
So the researchers at the University of Michigan came up with the bright idea of using four high-powered IMAX projectors to simulate the heat of the sun. And they found that the Faraday cup actually performs better when heated as the heat decontaminated the system. Much of the data we have received from these instruments is of little interest to the average space enthusiast. Raw data that will provide scientists with valuable clues to the nature of the sun. But there is one sensor on board relaying images back to Earth that we can all enjoy. During a solar eclipse, we can observe a beautiful phenomenon. Bright loops of light dancing around the sun. These fantastic patterns are created by glowing electrons sailing around the sun on magnetic field lines, distorted by solar winds. We have been able to observe the streams of high energy electrons from Earth and our solar observatories parked in Lagrange Point 1, but we have never, until very recently, been able to observe them from up close. As the Parker space probe dipped into the corona for its ninth encounter with the Sun, it began recording from its wide view imager, here on the spacecraft. The images it delivered looked like a car passenger's view of a passing snowstorm on a dark night. Bright atomic particles streaming by the probe as it dips into the eye of the solar storm. Beautiful images that no doubt are giving scientists unparalleled data on the nature of these coronal streamers. The solar probe will have many more rendezvous with the sun, with the next due in September of 2022, and with another two Venus gravity assists, the Parker space probe will be breaking its own records in 2023 and 2024, bringing us even closer to the sun. And while we are getting closer to the sun in our skies, we are also getting closer to recreating the sun here on Earth for boundless fusion power. The current record for fusion power is set at 70%, meaning we managed to reclaim 70% of the power needed to get the fusion reactor started. We are still well away from being able to actually create power using fusion, but ITER, a new fusion reactor, is due to be completed in 2025, with worldwide cooperation helping to fund its astronomical cost, upwards of $45 billion making it one of the world's most expensive science experiments in human history. This documentary on CuriosityStream shows the behind the scenes of Europe's previous generation of magnetically confined plasma fusion reactors. It's a fascinating watch that you can get access to by signing up to a yearly CuriosityStream membership for just over $1 a month. This deal gets you access to all the award-winning documentaries on CuriosityStream and access to our upcoming Battle of Britain series, we are just putting the final touches on the first episode, which will be launching on the 25th of February. Here's a quick trailer for what you can expect. There can be no peace until Hitlerism and its monstrous parasites are utterly obliterated. A war like no other began in the summer of 1940. A war that would change the face of modern warfare forever. The world's first war to take place entirely in the skies. A war of attrition, a battle that was won and lost by the actions of a few. This is the Battle of Britain. I'm incredibly excited to share this series we've been working on for over a year, and you can get access to it for just over $1 a month. This is by far the best way to support this channel and help us to continue developing our abilities as documentary filmmakers. You can sign up to this amazing deal right now by clicking this button on screen. Or if you're looking for something else to watch right now, you can watch our last video on the future of carbon taxes. or you could watch Real Science's latest video on the incredible biology of carnivorous plants.